I have to admit, this kind of reminds me of when you're, you know, you're one of the first few rows of an airplane and you see people coming in, <laughs> and then there's a gap, you say, oh, everyone's here. Oops, no, it's not, they're still coming, so. We're gonna be a few minutes late in the start, but we'll add a couple minutes at the end before we go off to lunch in the section meetings. <coughs> So, good morning, everyone. And uh, I don't want to disappoint you, but I do not have another 100 names to read this morning. <laughs> so, good morning again, and welcome to the Forum on Transitioning to Net Zero Carbon. One point that I should make is, uh, as was the case with the special lecture, we put together a, an organizing committee of at least one member from each one of the sections as well as a representative from John's Business Advisory and Racial Justice and Equity Committee. Um, and we brainstormed, looked at input we'd gotten from members through a variety of means, and focused this down to the particular area of energy that we'll be looking at today. And then I would like to thank in particular Tom Degnan and Dick Alkire, who were two members of that committee, but who happened to be the ones at the center of the plate for where this ended up. It's very typical that there'll be a couple of members of the committee that sit right at the center of the, of the spectrum of topics, and they're the ones that then lend the biggest hand in pulling this together. I'd also like to comment and, and commend the uh, presentation and the discussion we had with John Holdren. It's really coincidental that there's such alignment between that lecture and this one, but I think we need to take advantage of that alignment in what we do here today. I think we all know that the energy transition is well underway, that many countries and regions have already committed to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions and replace them with renewable and other non-carbon producing, producing uh, energy sources. Renewable energy prices are falling, technology developments are being enabled and put into place, and there's an increased, uh, uh, increased focus on energy efficiency. And I also agree that I think this is gonna have to be all hands on deck in terms of who works on the problems. Also, all energy sources need to be available. This is the wrong time, in my view, to pick one or two and say we don't need to worry about the rest. I think everything needs to be on the table at the present time. The NAE and its members, uh, as I said, used our collective resources in order to put this, put this particular uh, uh, forum together, and I think we'll find this very, very interesting. Rather than introducing each one of the panelists, let me just start and introduce Deanne Bell, who will serve as our, as our forum moderator. This is the fourth time I think she's done this, twice in three dimensions and twice in two dimensions, if my memory, memory is right. Yeah. Deanne is a mechanical engineer, and if she looks familiar, television host and entrepreneur. Her TV hosting credits include PBS, ESPN, the Disney Channel, National Geographic, uh, DIY Network, and NBC's Make Me a Millionaire Inventor. She's the founder and CEO of Future Engineers, an education technology company that engages students in online contests and challenges. And recently, her company was selected by NASA to host the Mars 2020 Name the Rover Contest. She spent year, three years working at Raytheon, so some good industrial experience, as an optomechanical engineer. Her BS is in mechanical engineering from Washington University in St. Louis. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Deanne, and I'll be back up at the end to close. Thank you. Thank you so much, Al. Uh, and hello, everyone. Welcome to this year's annual forum. It's, it's good to see many familiar faces. Good to be in person again, right? Um, so I'm really excited for you guys uh, to, to participate in this forum today. We have an exciting forum lined up. Uh, this year's forum topic is all about transitioning to net zero carbon and looking at the engineering challenges and opportunities. And I think we all know that the time is now, right, when it comes to addressing climate change. I mean, daily, we're, we're seeing the effects from, from fires to floods to extreme weather to extreme stress on the grid. Um, but the time has also been set. Global leaders have set a goal to reach net zero carbon by the year 2050. And to do that will require significant investment, significant innovation, significant advocacy, um, and engineers are at the forefront of that work. And I'm honored today to be joined on stage by uh, these phenomenal panelists who are all going to address this topic head on, the engineering challenges and opportunities of transitioning to net zero carbon. So today, we have Gavin Towler, who's the CTO and Vice President of Research and Development at Honeywell Performance Materials and Technologies. Gavin's gonna be sharing his thoughts on uh, fossil and renewable energy. Next, we have Sarah Kurtz. 
Sarah is professor at the University of California Merced, Merced and she's going to be discussing solar power. Next, we have Jose Reyes. Jose is the co-founder and chief technology officer at New Scale Power, and he's going to be discussing small modular reactors. Then we have Catherine McCarthy. Kathy is the U.S. ITER Project Director at Oak Ridge National Laboratories, and she's going to be talking about nuclear energy on the grid. And in that, fa that fifth seat, we have Amy Halloran. Uh, Amy is the Director of Nuclear Fuel Cycle and Grid Modernization at Sandia National Laboratories, and she's going to be discussing next generation grid. And so the way the forum's going to work, similar to previous years, is uh, each of our panelists here are going to have uh, some time to share their expertise with all of us in the room. And then once all of our panelists are done with their presentations, we're going to transition to questions, which is where you guys get to be the brilliant engineers that you are and ask insightful questions so that collectively we can have a nice dialogue and hopefully try to find some great answers. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our very first speaker, Dr. Gavin Towler. Uh, Gavin Towler is a chemical engineer by training and is chief technology officer of Honeywell Performance Materials and Technologies. He's been a member of the NAE since 2015, and his full bio is in your program if you'd like to read more. And Gavin, you can take it away. Thank you, Deanna. Well, it's uh, a little uh, tough to find anything original to kick off this topic after following on from John Holdren. Um, <laughs> one, one of the themes of this morning that came through strongly was the importance of interdisciplinary courses and interdisciplinary teaching. And uh, I first started looking at large scale systems analysis in the energy industry when taking John and Mark Christensen's uh, ER200 uh, class at Berkeley. Um, I, I feel that I've spent most of the last 32 years reworking some of the homework problems. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm not litigating for my grade anymore, John. I, 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 I accept the grade that you gave me. Um, <laughs> but but um, I think many, many of us who worked in this space feel that, uh, that there's a constant challenge in, in reworking some of these problems. And of all the classes I took at Berkeley, I think this one, it actually advertised itself as there is one differential equation in this class. It was the easiest class from a math standpoint, and it was the toughest of all the classes because it was so interdisciplinary. It was the first time as an engineer that I'd had to write essays um, where there were, there were poli sci majors who, who were able to articulate their thoughts much better than I could, where there were economists, and uh, it really did teach you to think about the entire problem at a systems level. And this really is what the energy transition is all about. It is a systems level problem. So, John's already said a lot of this. Um, we, we all know the, the issue of global warming. If we do nothing, we get to somewhere in the range of three to four degrees C. If we do absolutely everything that every government has promised so far, we might get to something like two and a half degrees. If we really pull out the stops and do what the IPCC has been telling us, we still have a chance to get to 1.5. But we've got about three years to do that. Um, before we, we'll, we'll miss the 1.5 without spending a lot more money. We kind of all know what the solution is. We need to decarbonize the energy supply. And most of the technologies that uh, are needed to do that, either electrification or switching to um, low greenhouse gas fuels like hydrogen, are well known. The only sector that's really got a lot of very interesting um, things still to be determined is aviation. And there, the sustainable aviation fuel from biomass. There could be um, electric aircraft in the future. There could be hydrogen aircraft. So aviation still got uh, the potential for deciding which technologies. But in most, in most sectors of the economy, we know what the um, alternative uh, lower greenhouse gas emitting energy sources are. But the challenge, if you look at a societal level, if you look at the level of a building, a city, a nation state, a company, a oil refinery, you can plot an abatement curve. You can rank all those options in terms of how much CO2 you can reduce and what it costs per ton of CO2. So you can put all those things on one chart. Uh, McKinsey's done charts like this. This is a McKinsey example here. The challenge is every time you look at an abatement curve, there's not much stuff on the left. There's a lot of stuff on the right. So all the things on the left are things that have a payback. The things on the right actually cost you money. This costs you money. And therefore, we're not moving at the pace that we need to. And so this is a challenge to all of us as, as engineers and scientists, is how do we reduce the cost of those things on the right, and even the things on the left, to make it easier to fund this energy transition. We've done our own modeling. I, I am still reworking those homework problems, John. It might take me a few more years. Um, the, these are some models that we developed of what a future energy demand would look like. The, these are two models, both consistent with 1.5 degree warming. And um, we named them golf and yoga because these correspond to different views of the world in terms of the energy intensity of GDP. So a, a golf view of the world is a world that wants to be like America, have big houses in wide suburbs with big closets, which we fill up with stuff. 
<laughs> and because of that, we need to manufacture lots of things in a golf scenario. And if this is the way the rest of the world develops, we'll need a lot more energy to do that. The yoga scenario is a world where everybody wants to li live like Japan. And actually, two other countries that are very like Japan, people very, very rarely can guess this, Italy and the United Kingdom have similar energy intensities to Japan. So in a world where we want more virtual goods, where we don't buy as much stuff, where we, we uh, um, have a lower carbon footprint, but in either of these scenarios, you can see the total energy grows from 18 terawatts today to roughly 28 in the yoga scenario, roughly 40 in the golf scenario. So massive expansion is needed. It's not just about transitioning the energy that we currently use in the OECD. It's about meeting the needs of developing countries to satisfy the growth expectations of their society. And so we have to actually expand the energy supply while at the same time moving away from coal, oil, and gas towards wind, solar, nuclear, other um, zero carbon or low carbon energy, and hydrogen for those applications that are difficult to electrify. And so this is the challenge to all of us as engineers. We're behind pace. We have about two to three years to get back on pace. Otherwise, we won't hit the 1.5 target. We, if you read the uh, AR6 report from the IPCC, we have about um, eight to 10 years to get on pace to hit two degrees. We're spending about half a trillion dollars a year on energy transition. And that needs to be something more like $2 trillion a year by the end of this decade and be sustained at at least $2 trillion a year for the next 30 years. It's phenomenally expensive, and we, we, the technical community, need to find ways to make it less expensive. We've got to bring these costs down. Every, th there is no area of the energy economy that cannot be innovated to make it lower cost, whether that's carbon capture, whether it's reducing the cost of uh, solar power, which is one of our grand challenges, whether it's um, uh, bringing nuclear fusion to commercial scale applications, there are many, many things that we can do, but all of these things need, a, need technical advances to lower the price ticket to make them more socially acceptable. So with that, let me pass on. Great. Thank you so much, Gavin. Okay, and then our next panelist is Dr. Sarah Kurtz. So Sarah Kurtz is a professor at the University of California Merced after more than 30 years at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. She studied multiple aspects of solar energy and how to implement it in our energy systems. She's also an NAE member since 2020. Go ahead, Sarah. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I've been a member since 2020, but this is my first opportunity to be here in person with you. Um, following on what John and Gavin have said, I agree very much with what they presented, and I'll be focusing largely on how it's an interdisciplinary topic, and a key message I have is that we've invented, the engineers have been very successful in developing good technologies. We should be really smart in how we use them. So today, solar power is, has been a big success. I'll show you some numbers on that, and it's poised to be, I think, an even bigger solution, um, a big part of the solution tomorrow. So historically, you've heard that solar energy is too expensive. And in fact, we just heard that it was a grand challenge here. But we've also just seen the data about how the cost has reduced by more than a factor of 10. And so this announcement in 2020 from the IEA, they concluded that solar power can provide the cheapest electricity. So maybe not on the North Pole if you need electricity in the winter, but locations around the world where it's sunny, solar power is now the cheapest electricity in history. A useful metric for you to think about. If you hired someone to, to paint the walls in this room, the cost you'd have to pay them, or the price per square meter, is comparable to the cost um, price per square meter for solar panels today. So it's really phenomenal how the price has come down. And with that, there's been a lot deployed. So this spring was the announcement that the solar has deployed a terawatt. Probably most of you don't think in terms of terawatt. What is a terawatt? So if you turned on all the solar panels in the world, which isn't possible because the sun only shines on half of the world at a time, um, you would have a terawatt <laughs> of electricity. But um, in the US, we have um, about 1.2 terawatts of generating capacity. So if all the panels today that have been um, deployed were turned on at the same time, it would be about enough to instantaneously power um, the US, which is quite an accomplishment. I think you'll agree. Um, but it's still small. The top row of pie charts we have here shows the fraction of electricity that's generated by the different technologies. And in 2021, solar only provided about 
But if you look at the bottom row, this is looking at how the new capacity is expanding. And what you see is that about 80% of the expanded capacity every year is coming from renewable energy. And as a fraction of that, about half of that is solar. So if we continue this, now question is, do we have patience? What we just heard is that we've got three or four years. So putting in this fraction of solar for three or four years is not going to transform the electricity grid. But if we could continue it, if we had the, the time to just wait for 30 or 40 years, we've already demonstrated that tomorrow's grid will look more like what the bottom row of, of net expansions looks like today. Um, the reason, so when we're looking at how to move quickly, I think it's useful to think about why solar grew so quickly. And I would assert that the positive feedback loop that came from the enthusiasm about solar, enthusiasm about clean energy that people could own themselves, coupled with favorable policy, and then the increased deployment, then that brought about lower costs, which brings increased enthusiasm. And this feedback cycle then can allow you to grow very quickly. As we move to the next step of implementing solar into our bigger energy system, we've heard it's a very complex thing, but that means that there are so many more ways for positive feedback loops to occur. So I suggest we start with renewable electricity as a foundational part of moving away from a carbon emissions grid. And we couple that with electrification, so that's if you have your internal combustion engine vehicle, you can replace it with an electric car. And then we need to couple that with a flexible grid to balance this generation with the demand. And historically, the grid has had to balance those because demand has not been constant. I heard that when the annual cup reaches the half time, there's an engineer that goes over and turns on another power generator in order to meet the, the increased load when everybody goes and um, plugs in their tea kettles. So storage <laughs> is obviously a key part of a flexible grid, but there are lots of other options. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about the details of what you think about there. Here in California, well, I'm now living in California, and California is really a leader in that in 2021 of the electricity generated in the state of California, 25% was generated by solar. That's a real accomplishment compared to the 4% globally. But what you see then happens is here we have the generation for a day and the top black dotted line is the, the load that was for the California electricity that day. And you can see that when the sun came up, the, we had so much generation from the solar that the supply then began to exceed the demand. And so at some level you can export that as long as your neighbors aren't in a similar situation. Um, and you can look at this as a problem that, well, we've got too much electricity, what are we going to do with it? We maybe have to throw it away. Or you can look at it as an opportunity. And what I'd like to suggest is we should be creative. So um, an obvious thing is we can use storage. And in fact, in the recent heat wave, the batteries at one point were putting on 3.3 gigawatts of power. The entire state of California was using about 50 gigawatts. So of that, um, a, the 3.3 gigawatts is a substantial amount. But you can also be smarter than that and look at, for example, when do we charge electric vehicles? In California, um, where I live, PG&E offers a utility rate that we can charge between, say, midnight and 2 a.m. and get the low EV rate. Um, wouldn't it be better if the EVs were charged during the day when we have the excess of solar electricity? So I suggest that we can be smart and invest in the infrastructure that will provide the low-cost solution. So if we put EV charging in the daytime parking lots, you can imagine that you drive to work in the morning, you just plug in the vehicle, it only takes about 15 seconds, and then when you finish your work at the end of the day, you can drive home and have a vehicle that's fully charged from the solar panels it was sitting underneath. And when you get home, if you need a little electricity to cook your dinner, you can actually plug your um, car in and use that when you get home. Contrast that with if we invest in infrastructure where everybody stops on the way home and does a fast charge at something comparable to a current gas station, 
Then we have to have that added battery during the day, and then we have to figure out how to get all that electricity um, to the, the vehicles um, during that short amount of time. And there's going to be no way then that you're going to want to use that battery to power your, your um, house at night. So I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I want to start charging my car during the day now. <laughs> um, so, so next we're going to talk about uh, small modular reactors. And I know uh, in the previous um, uh, presentation there was some discussion of this. Um, so next um, I'm honored to present or to introduce you to Dr. Jose Reyes. Jose Reyes is the Chief Technology Officer and co-founder of New Scale Power. He's a professor emeritus in the School of Nuclear Science and Engineering at Oregon State University and a member of the NAE since 2018. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here today. It's, uh, it's exciting to see so many faces in person uh, and to see uh, so much uh, opportunity and potential to change the world. Now, uh, I've developed this, uh, this concept for a small mod reactors. We've been commercializing this for, for quite a while. I co-founded the company back in 2007, and we've made uh, enormous progress. And so I'll share a little bit uh, today of, of what's different about small modular reactors, uh, what they are. Uh, but uh, you know, an SMR, or a small modular reactor, is typically categorized as a, a reactor that's under 300 megawatts electric. Now, ours is only 77 megawatts, so it's, it's really small. Uh, it's factory manufactured, so that makes it different. Uh, and not only is the reactor manufactured in a factory, but also the containment. So you're used to seeing the big concrete containment dome. Uh, well, we've gone to a small steel vessel, uh, which can be pressurized to about 1,000 pounds per square inch if necessary. By factory manufacturing, we're able to do something unique for nuclear. Uh, we can do this in a factory that allows us to ship it in parts, three parts basically, uh, by truck, rail, or barge. Uh, and then it gets deployed in an already constructed facility. So you're doing your manufacturing, your high quality manufacturing in a factory, while in parallel you're, you're doing your civil construction on site. The installation of the reactor is basically an installation as opposed to a construction. So that greatly reduces the time. It drops our construction time from five years uh, to three years from first pour of concrete. So that innovation allows us to do something unique for nuclear. And that's why there's so much interest in small modular reactors. Uh, of course, uh, we're designing for the modern grid. So I've, I've uh, worked with utilities, at 28 utilities in the US and Canada over many years. Uh, and now we're in 12 countries in discussions about small modular reactors. We kept hearing three messages. Uh, the first was we have aging coal fire plants and they need to be retired. We need to replace them with, uh, with clean energy. The second message I had, I've heard consistently is we have a lot of renewables and we need help stabilizing the grid. Uh, so what can we do for that? And thirdly, and more recently, uh, we have an, an immediate need for energy independence, energy security. Uh, so that's coming up quite a bit. Uh, in fact, uh, 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 the Czech Republic, Romania, Estonia, uh, Poland, uh, Ukraine, all have, uh, have uh, reached out to us to talk about the possibility of small mod reactors in their countries. So what does it mean to be designed for the modern grid? Well, first of all, uh, safety. Uh, I, I really appreciate the, the talk that uh, John gave just a, a while ago, but safety is really important. And if you, have, if you look at the checklist, that's a key thing. So for this design, uh, under the worst case conditions, uh, the reactors will shut themselves down without operator action, without AC or DC power, and they'll remain cooled for an unlimited period of time without the need to add water. So let that sink in for just a moment. So we're the first commercial nuclear uh, design that's been approved by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission with this level of safety. It is a game changer. Uh, if you think about what's happening, happening right now uh, uh, in Ukraine with the reactors there, uh, the concern about losing power uh, or connection to the grid, which is needed for safety. Well, this type of design, it's not an issue. So that's a big step forward. So I think we had to improve the level of safety in order to increase the penetration of nuclear. The second thing is additional flexibilities. Uh, this, uh, the, this design has been approved without the need for connection to any grid. Uh, we can do off-grid operation. That's a first for nuclear power. That means we can go right next to those uh, end users that need power uh, for carbon-free uh, 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 hydrogen production, ammonia production, for a wide range of applications, which in the past, nuclear could not support. Resilience, uh, as we see increased uh, severe weather events, 
Uh, these are hardened facilities designed for tornadoes and hurricanes, and, uh, you name it. Uh, they're, they're very hardened facilities. Uh, load following is something that we were asked about. Providing load following, frequency hunting, these are things that we can provide with this type of a design. Uh, and because it's smaller, uh, we think it's more cost effective and could be deployed uh, more quickly. Seismic, uh, cyber security, all these things are part of our design that we've had to include. Uh, and of course, uh, if you look at what the different applications that, could be, uh, that can be provided, uh, a big one is hydrogen. We've done studies in all these different areas. Uh, we looked at a design where we, we took eight of our modules, eight of our 77 megawatt modules, and provided power and steam uh, to a uh, 250,000 per day, uh, barrel per day oil refinery. What we found is we can reduce carbon emissions from that facility by 40%. 200 metric tons per hour reduction in CO2 from a 250,000 barrel per day oil refinery. We did a hydrogen study with Idaho National Laboratory. Uh, one of our modules connected to high temperature steam electrolysis could produce almost, almost 50 tons of hydrogen per day. And so we're looking not just at hydrogen production, but we're looking at commercial scale hydrogen production. As we talk to the oil majors, uh, they're saying we need 200 to 250 metric tons of hydrogen per day. Uh, and we need it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's our goal. We need to be thinking in much larger scale if we want to make a big change. So think, think large scale, 250 uh, metric tons a day per hydrogen, 30,000 tons of uh, ammonia per year. Uh, these are things that can be achieved and they can be achieved now. Uh, the other things that we did, desalination, about 77 million gallons of clean water per day with, uh, with uh, one module and uh, reverse osmosis. Uh, so lots of opportunities to make a, a big change. Now, we've heard today that uh, we need a big impact, and we need it in a short time scale. Well, nuclear's not known for its speed. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> let me put that out up front. Uh, but it's exciting. Uh, we need to do three things. One, we need to align for impact, okay? Uh, what I mean there is we have, the, we have the policies now being developed in terms of state mandates for clean energy. Uh, we've got studies that are coming out, brand new studies, uh, least cost path. So a study in Pacific Northwest found that when you add small modular reactors to renewables, uh, in particular solar with battery, the reduction in cost was $8 billion per year uh, because you avoid overbuild. Uh, so this is a technology that, that is great to work with other technologies. Uh, the second thing is we need to design for impact. And so we've done something unique here. We're changing the philosophy of nuclear power, how you deploy nuclear power. Manufacturing on a mass scale, and it's high power density. So think about that for just a moment. Uh, if you have a factory that can produce three to seven modules uh, 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 per month, uh, you're adding the, the, the capacity to put a lot of clean energy on the grid very quickly. Uh, so this is, the, this is one of our big targets, is, is this mass manufacturing. The good news is that we've already ordered our, our, our forging dies that's now it, being made right now. Uh, by the, the first quarter, second quarter of 2023, uh, full-scale components are being built, and that first module will be ready for delivery in 2027. Uh, so we're excited that we're moving that forward, and as there are more orders for the plants, uh, it'll, be, uh, it'll be easier to get that, that, uh, uh, the manufacturers more engaged. And lastly, uh, we need to prepare for an impact, uh, to fund an impact. So the, if you heard about the, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, huge benefits from that. 30% uh, uh, cost incentive for, for any, any form of clean energy, uh, an additional 10% if you're replacing coal fire plant, and a $3 per kilogram of uh, credit if you produce hydrogen. Uh, so with that, I, I thank you so much for your time. So much to discuss, looking forward to the discussion. Thanks so much, Jose. Wonderful, and next I'm excited to introduce our next panelist, Dr. Catherine McCarthy. <coughs> Kathy McCarthy is the U.S. Eater Project Director at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. She spent half of her career in fusion energy and half in fission, and has been a member of the NAE since 2019. Great, thank you very much, and I really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you today. As you're going to hear, there are still many challenges, as you heard from John Holdren earlier, before practical fusion energy can be realized. But with the innovation from people like all of you, 
I believe that we can get there. So I'm actually going to talk about fusion and advanced fission energy and transitioning and sustaining net zero carbon, but I'm going to focus on the fission, on the, excuse me, the fusion side, because you heard quite a bit already from Jose. Now, one of the things that is important to point out is we need many different options in order to realize net zero or prefer preferably net negative carbon. This is important from the perspective of sustainability, from energy security, and so all of the above is really what's necessary for a lot of the reasons that you've heard previously. Fission and fusion are both nuclear reactions, so they are in that same family. In the case of fission, you have a heavier atom that splits and releases energy. In the case of fusion, it's lighter atoms that fuse and release large amounts of energy. The sun is a big fusion reactor. It works very well. It works very well because it's hot and the gravity is significant and that causes the reaction to happen. Now, a lot of times in the fusion world, we talk about bringing a star to Earth. There are different ways of doing this, and I'll cover them very, very briefly, but obviously there are challenges to that as well. Now, fusion has the potential to provide equitable global access to reliable electricity because the fuel is readily available. But again, challenges remain, and I would point out fission produces 20% of US electricity now. Fusion doesn't produce any but it is a very worthy goal, and that's why there are so many people looking at this, investing their time in many countries doing the same. So you've probably heard a lot in the news about fusion, and you're wondering why. So right now, there's almost $5 billion of private money that's going into fusion, into fusion research, and people like Bill Gates are investing, companies like Chevron are investing, and why is that? What has changed? So we've learned quite a bit about the plasma science, and that was really the starting position. And the US government invested in the plasma science side, because you have to be able to make that work. You have to be able to, to sustain, to control the plasma before you can think about a fusion, uh, fusion electricity. So a lot of progress has been made there. And the international experiment, ITER, I-T-E-R, and I, I, I was telling Deanne earlier that a lot of times when there are subtitles, they write it E-A-T-E-R. <laughs> but that's not what it is. It's I-T-E-R, which is Latin for the way. It's a large experiment that's being built in southern France. There are seven different entities, six countries. The United States is one of them, plus the European Union, all focused on the demonstration of what we of a self-heated plasma, or what we call a burning plasma. It will also do technology uh, research as well. So ITER is focusing on that, but what about the, the, the rest of the things? Where are the gaps? Well, modeling is one thing, and that's important, but we have to have data with which to validate our models. So earlier this year, the Joint European Taurus in the UK demonstrated 59 megajoules of fusion produced over a period of five seconds, and the physics models were correct. They accurately predicted that. That's really important, a really important piece of data. You may have also heard about the recent results from, the, uh, from NIF, the National Ignition Facility at Livermore National Laboratory. That's inertial fusion, so think implosion, as opposed to magnetic fusion, which is confined, confined by a magnetic field. And they produced 1.3 megajoules of energy. So quite a bit of energy produced. But how do we get from that to practical fusion energy, something that we can actually use? Well, we can engineer the solutions for fusion energy. If I go back to ITER for a second, ITER was designed to minimize the risk to a self-sustaining plasma. It is a science experiment. It is meant to provide data to then get us to a ultimately commercial fusion. It's highly diagnosed, many, many, many diagnostics, and it's large. It's large because that minimizes the risk to getting to, again, what we call a burning plasma or a self-sustaining plasma. There are three primary gaps in getting to practical fusion. I talked about the self-sustaining plasma. Next one is materials. 
And all of this really goes into the practical piece, the, the economic piece, because in the end, fusion will have to compete. Again, fission works, and that really is, is really a goal that fusion aspires to. Like fission, fusion materials has, have to survive in a very harsh environment, and you need to be able to operate continuously. You don't want to be changing out components because that'll mess up your economics. So that's a really important piece, and we do not yet have a material that would work practically in a commercial fusion plant. So there's some work going on there, and the U.S. government is now pivoting a bit to focus on the technology side, the engineering side, that, so that we can get to that practical fusion. The third is the fuel cycle. So we need to be able to produce fuel. Um, there are different, different um, atoms, different isotopes that are used. The easiest fusion reaction to obtain is deuterium-tritium. Easiest because we only have to go to 10 times hotter than the sun. <laughs> Some of the other fuel cycles actually require hotter than that. But one of the ways to produce tritium, the major way to produce tritium is with lithium. And again, as you look at the economics of this, you've got to be able to have the reactions happening while you're producing more fuel. So that fuel cycle is the third piece. Now, we're learning a lot from the ITER project. The US is responsible for 9.09% of the hardware. We are delivering components now. Um, as an example, one of them is the superconducting, the central solenoid superconducting magnets. All of these things help fusion broadly, and the connections between ITER and the private industry are important. In March, the White House held a fusion summit. And the idea was, let's bring together public and private and figure out how do we accelerate getting to practical fusion energy. And these public-private partnerships are going to be key. Now, what I would uh, point out is recently, Department of Energy came out with a funding opportunity announcement specifically focused on public-private partnerships, uh, developing the pathway to a fusion pilot plant starting with preconceptual designs. So, U.S. government is, is putting a lot of effort into this. Multiple private companies are looking at this because ultimately it's a worthwhile goal. So what I would say again is with people like you, Fusion has the possibility to not just that it would be, un, would be nice, but that Fusion actually will be nice in the future. Thank you. about fossils, renewables, solar, small modular reactors, the potential of fusion, and, and lastly we're going to hear about Next Generation Grid with Amy Holleran. So Amy Holleran is a professional engineer and the director of Sandia National Laboratory's research and development activities in nuclear energy, the electric grid, and energy storage. So it's time for your presentation. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, and there's a reason I'm going last here. It's because I'm going to talk about the grid that ties everything together that the previous speakers have talked about. Um, as you may know, the grid is actually three grids in the United States. There's the Eastern Interconnection, the Western Interconnection, and then ERCOT, which handles most of Texas. These grids consist of the substations, transformers, and power lines that connect electricity generation to the consumers. The grid is operated by regional balancing authorities who have the very complex job of matching up the energy demand to the supply. You only have to look at what's happened recently um, to see the impacts caused by mismatches in this demand and supply. In the winter of 2021, Texas experienced outages that left people without heat, lights, or clean water for many days. More recently, um, in California, they experienced power outages this summer because of multiple days of record-breaking heat across much of the state. These disruptions were partially because the nation's energy system was designed and built to handle the temperatures of the last century and not the extremes that we are experiencing now from climate change. Climate change and even our attempts to combat it pose real threats to the reliability and production of our deliver and delivery of electricity. For example, as we transition away from fossil fuel powered electricity, the U.S. will rely more and more on renewable energy sources, such as wind and solar. Renewable energy is predicted to increase more rapidly than the overall demand for energy through 2050, 
by the U.S. Energy Information Agency in their annual energy outlook released in March of this year. These renewable sources, however, are not always on the way that our existing fossil fuel powered plants are. They only generate electricity when the sun shines or when the wind blows. To accommodate these variable energy resources, massive amounts of energy storage will need to be connected to the grid to match up the energy generation and the energy demand. This energy storage can take many forms, from pumped hydro to batteries to hydrogen. Much of the current focus is on batteries, and therefore the EIA predicts growth in battery storage will parallel the growth in renewable energy generation. There are also seasonal disconnects between energy demand and energy generation, which will require some form of seasonal energy storage, such as pumped hydro or hydrogen, or a shift in nuclear energy, as pointed out by Jose and Kathy. Adding these storage resources will not be inexpensive. Grid-scale batteries are not cheap, and they are only one portion of the cost. The major components of a storage system include the underlying storage mechanism, such as the battery, and the power conversion system, the energy management system, and then the integration of all these components. The battery pack itself is less than 40% of the total system cost. Another reason for the high cost is the amount of storage that will need to be added. As of 2020, the U.S. grid had 32 gigawatts of storage, and 93% of that was in 43 pumped hydro energy storage plants. Much of this was created to allow nuclear power plants to operate at full capacity when demand was low. Recent story, studies by the National Renewable Energy Lab and others show that we may need five times to even 50 times this amount of storage on the grid by 2050. You can see how this will be expensive. Likewise, land-based wind and solar sites are often located in remote locations, far from where the electricity is consumed. New transmission lines will need to be built to transport the electricity from the generation sites to where the electricity is needed. According to the Transmission Agency of Northern California, it can take on average 10 or more years to plan, permit, and build a high voltage transmission line. Transmission lines are also expensive. A Wisconsin utility has recently notified their Public Service Commission that the cost for a 100 mile, 345 kilovolt transmission line will be more than half a billion dollars, partially due to pandemic-related increases in the cost of steel, insulators, conductors. All these factor into the investment called out in Gavin's presentation. Some of the mismatch in location will be mitigated as wind and solar <coughs> technologies advance. New turbine technologies will allow wind sites to be located in the populated areas with lower wind speeds. Solar PV costs have already experienced a dramatic cost reduction, as pointed out in Sarah's talk, making solar systems more economically viable in less sunny areas. For example, in 2022, Vermont received 16% of its energy from solar, a much higher percentage than sunnier states like Florida, Texas, and Arizona. The good news is that past dire predictions of grid collapse with even 20% renewable energy have not come true. The American Clean Power Organization points out that in the last several months, renewables have provided 36% of California's and 34% of Texas's electricity and consistently provide the majority of electricity in many other parts of the country, such as Iowa and South Dakota. Some of these predictions were made because the energy generated by wind and solar can suddenly drop out if the wind stops blowing or the sun stops shining. Therefore, advanced power electronics that can respond almost instantly are needed to manage the flow of electricity between the renewable sources and the grid. One specific area of power electronics that is needed for a modernized grid is solid state transformers. Today's transformers are designed to operate with one directional flow. Solid state transformers with their much faster response time would provide for higher controllability of the power flow. They would also be able to interface with power electronics converters from renewable energy sources. Many advances are being made in power electronics R&D. For example, Sandia National Labs has recently applied for a provisional patent on a power electronics-based controller that allows optimized control and functionality of storage systems made up of a variety of storage types. One other key to combating climate change is the electrification of the end-use demand, including transportation. 
As Sarah pointed out, this will not only increase the demand for electricity, but change the demand profile unless drivers are encouraged to, change, to charge during the day. The federal government is working to address some of these challenges. In April of this year, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission published a notice of proposed rulemaking that proposed requiring public utility transmission providers to conduct long-term regional transmission planning as, on a sufficiently forward-looking basis to meet transmission needs driven by changes in the resource mix and demand. The Department of Energy has many programs working to solve these challenges as well, from the Energy Storage Grand Challenge to the new grid deployment office that has been stood up. Their stated goal is to improve electricity delivery and reliability and to modernize and upgrade the electric grid and critical electricity generating facilities. The Grid Deployment Office will invest $17 billion in programs and projects to identify and address national transmission, distribution, and clean generation needs. In addition, the Grid Deployment Office will manage programs to keep nuclear power plants, which provide the biggest share of the country's carbon-free electricity, from retiring if they can operate safely and reliably, and to support upgrading and modernizing hydropower facilities. In summary, changes needed on many fronts to keep the grid delivering electricity on a day-to-day -day basis, um, and we're working on those solutions. Thank you. Um, so we're going to transition now to questions. Um, I'm going to kick off a few questions, but I encourage you all to go ahead and start queuing up, and we're going to take some questions from the audience here soon. Um, my first question um, is really thinking about, if we think about these kind of three pillars of innovation, of infrastructure, investment, um, in the different sectors that you work in, are they equally weighted? Is one just an extreme priority right now? Um, is the technology there? We just need to scale it up. Uh, can we scale it up, but we need the money? Um, so I'd love for, for each of you to kind of to, to touch on that. So Gavin, why don't you start? Yeah, I mean, as I said in the slide that I think the, we know the answers, but the, the, this, the, there are deployable technologies ready in all of these spaces, um, but the cost still could come down, right? Because they're, although they're deployable, they're not creating money. There's not a, a positive return on the investment. So um, you can, different countries around the world are looking at either incentivizing the energy transition by providing tax subsidies or um, incentives for making clean fuels. Some are doing it by legislation, by, saying, by putting in mandates, but which, whichever approach legislation settles on, the transition will go faster if you have better technology. So while it's absolutely the time to make investments and, and all the large companies in the in the um, you know the oil, gas, and transportation fuel sector are, are developing their plans, I think it's still Im Im critically important to keep innovating and bringing the costs down. Great. Sarah, I know we spoke a bit about this actually backstage um, in terms of investment as well, but I'd love to, to hear your thoughts on this. Yes, it's, I think it's really critical to look at all the different aspects at the same time. And within solar, the technology has advanced a long way, but there's still a lot more opportunity. Um, but a lot of the in innovations in the last decade or two have come from business innovations. A uh, uh, challenge with renewable energy technology is that the cost all comes up front. And so if you can get the investment to come up front, if you find a way that somebody can invest without having to put their money forward, they find an investor to partner with and then somebody else pays them back over the time, those innovations actually can expand the market very quickly. So there are a lot of opportunities, but all of them need to be done together and then we can move things forward faster. Got it. How about on the nuclear side? Yeah, so it's, it's uh, interesting because we've, uh, we have a, uh, a design which is deployable now. Uh, the, the, the challenge has been, uh, if, of course, that first of a kind. And so making sure that the, the, the first customer is not taking all the risks for the first of a kind. This is where the government has, has really done a great job. So the Department of Energy uh, has helped with that first of, first of a kind cost. And we're seeing the same thing now with, the, with this IRA, uh, that uh, they're willing to, to kind of put that money up front uh, to get things moving and so that the first customers don't take all the risk. Uh, so we're, we're leveraging an existing supply chain, so that works very well. Uh, it's a global supply chain, uh, so again, that works well. So it's now just getting moving uh, forward to scale up. 
So fusion is not going to be contributing to reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the next few years, in case you hadn't, hadn't <laughs> caught all of that. Um, I, I do think it's really important, though, we're always looking to improve. And so fusion is an energy source that can be providing important clean energy out in the future a bit. And what's needed to really get us to that point is investment um, and leveraging what's going on on the private side. There is more money invested on the private side than on the government side. And that's really a good thing because ultimately what we need to have is an energy source that can be turned over to industry. And fusion is complex. So having that early is very, very important. I was recently part of a National Academy study on a fusion pilot plant. And one of the important outcomes of that was that in order for fusion to have an impact on the energy transition, we needed to demonstrate in a fusion pilot plant by 2035 to 2040 timeframe. That came from talking with utility representatives who said, look, we're always planning for our energy futures. If you want to be part of the, by 2050, our plans, that's the time frame you need to think of. Now, I'll point out that time frame was not set by going through all the technology needs and the science needs and saying, yes, we can get there. The committee, including me, felt like we could get there, but there would certainly be challenges. So again, investments are needed. A lot of those investments are being made. Uh, Fusion is getting some investment from the IRA. Fusion is supported by uh, the Department of Energy. And then again, the private investment, leveraging that is extremely important. And I'll just add on, yes, investment is needed. Um, some of that is coming from the IRA that recently passed. Uh, storage, grid scale storage is available. You can have lithium ion battery storage that's been deployed, but uh, R&D in my opinion is needed in new battery chemistries. The Department of Energy is looking at that. We don't want to be relying on lithium that we can't mine enough out of the United States. Um, so making us energy and deployment uh, independent from a, a battery perspective is needed um, and just as I called out in my talk, investment in uh, solid state transformers and other things like that to be able to make the grid of the future much more efficient and reliable. Great. I have so many questions, but we have lines. <laughs> so I'm going to actually go out to the audience. Um, so when we take questions from the audience, um, just please introduce yourself and, and uh, give us your question. So we'll start over here. Nathan Meehan, a recent inductee and a guy who spent his career making more oil and gas. Uh, Gavin, uh, most of the forecasts I've seen uh, have us for net zero cases going from about our current levels of 100 million barrels a day uh, to about 50 million barrels a day uh, in 2050. Your slide, although it was only up there a little, a little briefly, looked like it was substantially lower than that. Uh, is, is that correct? And, and uh, I mean, that seem, it seems very difficult for me to see the 50 uh, percent reduction, uh, considering we haven't, we haven't slowed down coal use yet. Uh, but your, yours looked like it was more like 10 or 15 million barrels a day. That's a really kind of ext extreme number to me. But uh, is, is, did I read that right? Yeah, yeah it's an extreme case. Um, what I showed was a 1.5 degree scenario. Oh, the right. one if, I'd, if I'd showed you a two degree or a two and a half degree scenario, there'd still be natural gas, there'd still be oil there. But even actually that 1.5 degree scenario didn't completely eliminate oil and gas. Um, so if, you, if you're going to um, make a transformation that's going to get you to 1.5 degrees of warming, literally there has to be no more construction of natural gas or coal um, fired power at all within a couple of years. This is all in the AR6 report. It, it, it seems to me you, you also have to start shutting in coal plants that have just been constructed. Yep. Yep, you have to actually, you actually have to write off some stranded investments. You also have to write off and stranded investments in oil. And you have to, not only that, you have to rebuild all of the world's um, plants for making trucks, for making cars. They've all got to go to different drivetrain te technologies. Um, so it's, it's a, there's a massive investment to get to 1.5 degrees. The, the magnitude, as John said in his talk, right, people need, don't grasp the magnitude of the problem. You've got to redesign the entire infrastructure of all of the industries that supply transportation equipment, building equipment, mining equipment, 
They've all got to move to different drivetrain technologies. You've got to close down the natural gas and the coal-fired power plants or mitigate them with carbon capture. And I noticed in the yoga case, it looked like oil and gas was dropping faster than coal. Yeah, and that's another interesting thing. Um, that depends on how you look at it globally. But surprise, you, you talk about um, you know, transition fuels. Natural gas has obviously been touted as a, as a transition fuel. It should be a transition fuel. But if you look at the, um, again, scenarios to reach 1.5 degrees, the countries that need to decarbonize soonest are the ones with the biggest carbon footprint. They're largely in the OECD. They've largely already got out of coal, and they consume a huge amount of natural gas. So they actually need to reduce their natural gas use in order to decarbonize. Countries that, have, that should be allowed more time to decarbonize in high growth regions, places like India, China, Kazakhstan, Vietnam, they're very high coal users. So counterintuitively, you actually find that in scenarios where you allow those countries to develop, they will actually run their existing coal-fired power stations out into the 2060s, and they'll be the, the coal will actually be the last hydrocarbon to go. Okay, I, so I was reading your slides right. Thank you, thank you but I'm, I'm going to bet the over. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Thanks so much. Great questions there. Um, okay, we're going to take a question over here. I'm Mark Lobby with uh, North American Electric Reliability Corporation. Uh, I'm the senior vice president and uh, chief engineer there, and uh, just inducted into Section 6 this year, so 2020, but finally got together this year. <laughs> um, what, the way in which we used to build and design the system, and I, I'm following on to uh, Dr. Holloman's comments, is based on capacity. And capacity gave us energy and essential reliability services. And that equation now is being flipped, which is okay, but you have to recognize it. This is an energy problem that we're trying to solve now, not a capacity problem. So putting capacity numbers up don't mean a lot. You know, what, what you really need to know about is what kind of fuel can I depend on and what is going to be the energy from that fuel. Uh, there are really kind of four pillars in this. We call it a metamorphosis more than a transition because it truly is it's a caterpillar going to a butterfly. Uh, you, know, you have the no low carbon carbon energy resources. You need transmission because um, what's, we're going to see more extreme weather, right? It's not rare, it's just extreme. And what was extreme weather now was not extreme weather before. High winds in Iowa that takes out 16,000 megawatts of wind because the, the, the wind turbines cut off, or a month without clouds, which is basically Minnesota in February, uh, is something you have to plan for and, ha and have sufficient transmission or infrastructure to support, and that's, I think there's an underinvestment in infrastructure in the United States. Being able to balance uh, those resources, that's the flexible grid we talked about before. But remember, I'm thinking here about widespread long-term events, not four hours, two weeks of cold weather, two weeks of hot weather. Uh, you're not going to always be able to depend on a battery storage, and that's why the new chemistries may have some offer, or maybe other types of storage facilities. And then finally, just a good energy supply, energy reserves of some sort or another, and they can take, a, uh, a, a, it can take a, a many different forms, be it hydrogen, as we were talked about before, maybe that dirty natural gas or something that supports the transformation. Right now, what we're facing with, and it's, it's wonderful news in the sense that we have a substantial amount of photovoltaics in the queues to be built over the next 10 years, but we're not seeing the balancing resources and the transmission coming in to support that transformation. So, so, yeah. so I'm hearing the, the four pillars. Um, do you, let's get to the question. The question is, <laughs> yeah, I was going to get the question until you interrupted me. Yeah. The question is, how do you see that investment occurring in the near future because it's needed now more than it's going to be needed 5, 10, 20 years from now. It's, we're actually seeing it right now. Thank you. Great. Thanks. So I, I think it's similar to kind of our initial in investment question, but in the context of these four pillars. Does anyone want to, to take that on? Yeah, go ahead. So, so there is some of that investment going on through the recent legislation <laughs> that was passed. Um, I would say it's not enough, especially with respect to transmission, as you pointed out. Um, and one of the biggest problems is what our, our previous speaker talked about is the nimbyism, um, the banana, banana. Um, <laughs> you know, is that people don't want to put in high voltage transmission lines in their backyard. Um, and we really need to, as a, as a country, come together um, to be able to allow us to move forward. Um, in these areas, and part of the issue is the permitting time. Again, it takes 10 years to get a, a high voltage line permitted to begin to even begin construction. 
Um, I, you know, how long does it take to get a nuclear power plant um, permitted? So that's some of the biggest issues that we face. I think are going back again to the keynote speaker is the societal issues. Um, Yes, it is funding, but if we get past the societal issues, hopefully then society will be willing to fund these investments moving forward. Yeah, and I'm going to follow on to that. I, I mean, we'll go back to this yoga golf scenario <laughs> that you put up there. Um, in terms of an expectation of being a global citizen, um, do you think if we, if we look at the magic ball towards 2050, are there extreme changes in our behaviors and our habits that need to happen? Or do you think the technology can get us there where we, we, we aren't expecting to sacrifice a, a ton of things? And if any of you guys want to comment on that, I'll start here because you brought the yoga and golf up. <laughs> it, it, it's interesting. I don't know that there are extreme things that we have to sacrifice, but I think that we do need to recognize that the people of Africa and South Asia and Southeast Asia are as entitled to a good quality of life as we are, right? So we, the, we, we I, I use the word we a lot when I talk about climate change. We, we, the human race, have to look out for all of each other because we've, we haven't all made this problem, but we're all going to have to live with it. So the, there does have to be a recognition of um, the broader themes of sustainable development, right? The UN Sustainable Development Goals and, and the entitlement of people who are currently living in poverty to have a much higher quality of living. Um, th does that mean that we need to change radically how we consume? I think in the United States we do consume too much, my personal view. Um, but that doesn't mean that we have to make a whole lot of sacrifices because we've actually accumulated a lot of capital goods. We need to stop going out and buying more. We can live within some of the, the capital accumulation that we already have and make, make more room for other people around the world to get entitled to a similar quality of life. So um, some, of that, some of that change happens naturally, right? If you look at the rich countries, their, their energy consumption per GDP has gone down. And um, there's, there's still room to improve. It's harder in a big country, a big and somewhat cold country like the United States, or a big and very cold country like Canada, or even a big and warm country like Australia, to get to the same level of, in, of energy intensity as you can in a little island like the UK or Japan, or, or a country like Italy. But um, there's, still, there's still room for improvement improving energy efficiency. And it really is a situation where everything needs to be part of the solution. We, we, all, we all personally need to be part of the solution. Um, you know, it's interesting talking with my kids. My, my kids are much less interested in material things than they are in virtual things. And the, the general trend of younger people to want to spend more time on virtual activities, spend more of their income on virtual activities, probably all helps. So all of these things will come together. Um, it all needs to accelerate if we're going to get to the, uh, the target of uh, keeping global warming below two degrees. Great, great thoughts. I know as someone who works in engineering outreach, and, and it was brought up earlier about you know, having one voice and, and being very great at communicating the needs. So I think hearing some of these things and hearing things like, you know, charge during the day, not at night, all these things, we need to get the word out there. Um, so great, we're gonna take some more questions over here. We're gonna go, there's not a microphone in the back, is there just these two? Okay, right here. Great, uh, Mark Bartow, Texas A&M, former director of Energy Institutes, the University of Delaware and the University of Michigan. Um, Actually, you just headed the discussion down the path that I, I wanted to, to, to comment on. Uh, I, I think we often tend to, to uh, frame these discussions in terms of the supply side and how we move forward and how that's going to change. And one of the things I try to encourage my students to do is look in the other end of the pipe. So what would a, a zero carbon world in 2050 look like? And what do we need to do to try to make that a reality? We've heard about uh, need for more grid infrastructure, but we're going to need more than the present grid on steroids when we electrify transportation. If we have, when, I should let me say when, we have small modular reactors and distributed uh, nuclear generation, right? That's going to affect the investment we need to be making in, in transmission lines. And, and so, Part of it's the infrastructure investment, but I think as you just alluded to, there's also the opportunity to frame our policy in, in that kind of thinking. We have a bad habit of you know, subsidizing what we think would be a good idea today and turns out to meet not to be down the road like the renewable fuel standard. Uh, um, you know, and, but the same with, with the public discussion. And so how can we begin to avoid the nimbyism and the reaction of people to uh, having something pushed on them uh, with promises that will be better as opposed to 
selling the vision of what could be and the kinds of behaviors that we need to incentivize over the next 28 years till 2050. Great. So, I mean, I think I think the, the big overarching question in there was, you know, what is what is net zero carbon look like in 2050? And so why don't we start with nuclear and then we're going to go to solar. Um, I'm sure you have visions of 2050, <laughs> <laughs> everyone having solar everywhere. But let, let's go ahead and start with nuclear first. Yeah, so let me let me just start off. It's it's real interesting to, 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 to have a vision for 2050. Uh, there's, a, there's a great curve uh, that was developed by the United Nations. Uh, and it's the human development index on the on the y axis and then energy per capita on the on the x axis and what i saw there was that uh, it, it for for small incremental gains in energy per capita uh, for those developing nations they're on a steep curve and a small change makes a big difference to their lives uh, so i would i would start framing it in terms of uh, you know uh, this where should our resources be focused and where could you get the most gains for the for the, the least amount of energy change uh, and so that's a, that's a great way to look at it so in 2050 what will the world look like well i think you you look at the 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 flat flatter part of that uh, of that curve uh, where you have uh, the united united states uh, the uk and other nations who have a lot of uh, carbon emissions maybe coming down uh, being more accepting of of uh, uh, some of the restrictions but like we said they're not these are not extreme things uh, and you'll see the, the 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 developing nations which are finally getting access to some of these small incremental changes in energy per capita uh, because of some of the new clean energy technologies that are being developed like solar uh, like small mod reactors and, and others uh, you'll start seeing those being lifted up at least that's my vision I hope that's <laughs> that's what we'll see Go ahead, Sarah, yes. Yes, so I'm looking at 2050, there could be lots of directions it goes, whether it's the nuclear um, in a different form or geothermal or lots of things. But solar, as I, as I portrayed there, has, is a success so far and can be one of the solutions. I think we heard um, earlier that there are lots of different ways to get there. So if you want to use solar, we could use 50% of our energy could come from solar. Um, but a couple of things that we'll need, one is we will need to have a way to store so that when the sun sets, we can continue to benefit from the solar energy. But the other is to think about if you are a user of electricity or user of any kind of energy, and you can get two or three cent a kilowatt hour electricity, what opportunity can you um, do with that? Could you get a low, um, economic, a low capex investment, and maybe instead of running your factory 24-7, which is your preference, that you just run it when the sun is shining and you've got the two cent an hour uh, electricity. So this is like going back to you can charge your vehicle during the day, or you can plan to use storage and then have to charge it whenever you want, and there are going to be people who want to do both. But if we're creative, you can make the ammonia and the fertilizer during the day and then put it on the shelf and you store it all night. And that's actually a pretty inexpensive way to get storage. Kathy, we'll go to you next. I just want to add a little bit um, to what Jose had said. I do not see getting to net zero carbon in 2050 without substantial increase in nuclear energy. I just don't think that there's a way to do it, um, especially when we're talking about electrification of transportation and all these sorts of things. That has to be done cleanly. I do believe there is the potential for, for fusion to have some operating reactors, but in a big way, what we need is nuclear fission in order to get there by 2050. I think the other thing we need to understand is this is a very complex system engineering problem. We talk about doing certain things, that has unintended consequences in many other areas. So this is a really interesting and important problem that we have to look at because there are always unintended consequences to change behaviors. Gavin. Yeah, and I think, um, Mark, at the end of your question, you touched on what do we have to do to overcome societal resistance, right? And I think this was in, in what John said earlier as well, but we have to do two things that are extremely difficult for engineers. Um, what, one of them, we as engineers like talking to other engineers, <laughs> right? Because we, we, we can talk about complicated things and we can, we can dive into details and that's what we're good at, right? And we've actually got to get much better at getting the difficulty of the challenge, the magnitude of the problem, what happens if we don't do it, to be understood broadly in society, right? And, and that, that, means, that means being interdisciplinary. It means getting well outside of our comfort zone. And the other difficult thing that we have to do is we have to actually state some of these things simply. 
again, as engineers, we love to make things complicated because they are actually complicated. <laughs> and, and many of us have spent our careers understanding the, the, the details and the minutia of those complications in order to make them better, which is a very, very good thing. But it makes it very almost impossible to explain to people who don't have that technical background. And the general level of, it, of, of science and technology advancement has become so large that for most people, they can't understand it. And so they're left with almost magical thinking in terms of their, their understanding of, of how society works, how technology works, how technology can provide them with the benefits of the way of life that they've become used to. And they don't realize that uh, that's not sustainable. It needs to change. It's going to be difficult to do it. It can be done. It needs more work. And we, we, again, we as the engineering technical community have to actually explain that to people in terms they understand and get the buy-in of broader society. Well, and I tell my students, now you go tell your friends and family and others. It's not just uh, us experts that, that uh, are part of that. Thank you very much. Hey, next over here. Thank you. I first have to apologize. My name is not Mark, like the previous two people that asked the question. <laughs> My name is Dusan Borevich. I'm Associate Vice President for Research and Innovation in Energy Systems at Virginia Tech and actually with the office just across the river. Um, um, first, thank you, thank NAE, for bringing such an existential topic for today and for great presentations we heard this morning. Uh, the, I have two questions. One, I know something about, the other one, I don't. So one is to Amy. Um, based on electrification needs, we would need to transport energy two to four times, somewhere there, more than what we are transporting today through the grid. So who is talking about building two, three new grids in 10, 20 years from now? Or starting now, that's first part of that question. And second, why would we build that grid with 150-year-old technology, which cannot, period, balance continuously varying uh, sources with continuously uh, varying loads? And there are technologies that could do that, but why we will do that with the old one. So that's the first question. The second question is to Gavin, is um, based on all the numbers we heard here and John's presentation, cataclysmic actually. If we're gonna be spending tens of billions of dollars, this is tens of global GDP, why do we talk uh, about cents per kilowatt hour? Humanity, when they did things like that, it was only during the wars. Then humans were ready to spend 10, 20% of their GDP to win. Why don't this body declare or initiate a global war of humanity against climate change? Thank you. Great, thank you. So we're gonna separate that into two questions. And first one to Amy. Um, and I think broadly I'd say in 2050, how do you see the grid looking different to achieve uh, net zero carbon, and then um, in terms of building, he addressed like um, using innovative technologies versus going to some kind of antiquated technologies. So you wanna take that question? Sure, <laughs> sure. So I see the grid in 2050 as being much less of the three grids that we have now, and much more a set of maybe not microgrids, but smaller grids that are connected so that we can um, power them up, turn them off, and, and really from a reliability that's in everyone's best interest so that if there is a sudden spike in power or whatever, you can isolate that and you can isolate it from the other folks who are tied into the grid. And to have that, you need the advanced power electronics so that they can react much faster. And the federal government and the public utility commissions and the public utilities themselves and private utilities are all thinking about this. Um, but it is, there is investment needed to be able to move in that direction. Um, and there is, you know, um, as the previous question pointed out, it's a systems engineering problem. So there are systems engineers who need to be thinking about this and driving us to that future. Um, is that all of the question? Yes, I think okay. so. And I think, uh, and I'll go ahead and g keep going to the second one, which I'm gonna summarize is, how alarmist do we need to be right now? I mean, should we be, you know, freaking out and like, and uh, write me a huge check right now because we have two years to go, or three years to go? Um, how, I mean, I know we all are having a, a very healthy, uh, calm conversation right now, but when, when do we start pulling the alarms and when do we start saying, you know, that, 
this, this we start screaming as engineers. <laughs> go ahead. I, go ahead. <coughs> and me, Sarah, yes. yes. So I, th I think the key thing is to be most effective. So if we try to write a, a big check that puts us into a recession um, the, because of overdoing things, what we see right now is the world economies are kind of looking at higher energy prices, looking at inflation, looking at potential large recession in Europe. Um, if we go into a recession, our ability to mobilize a lot of private capital goes down. So we need to be smart and do it in the way that will enable us to move fastest. And so that's where I was saying earlier, being smart, we've got a lot of good technologies we can use today. If we're really smart about how we implement them, we can move faster. Anyone else want to chime in? Agree, disagree? Yeah, no, I, I would agree, and I, I think um, what I've observed is that we, ha we have this great big issue. It's a big challenge, uh, but we're, we're not aligned. <laughs> we're, not, we're not working together to, to, to resolve it. Uh, each, each of the different uh, the developers or, or, or portions of the industry have kind of their concept, and they want their concept to be the best and to be, be adopted. Uh, we really need to be integrating these, these great ideas, uh, working together to, to resolve this challenge. It's a huge challenge. I mean, I saw in Bloomberg was 16,000 gigawatts of, of, uh, of new carbon energy, free carbon free energy sources need to be deployed you know, by 2040. Uh, this is a huge, huge issue. Uh, so uh, we need to work together. And I, I like the, what, the, what John said about the stovepipes and not having these different silos where you're working in your own little world and you're just not talking to the folks uh, next to you. So I would encourage that as a, as a really important move of uh, a fundamental alignment to, to keep us moving forward in, a, in an efficient way. Anyone else? Maybe, maybe what we need to say is what the U.S. really needs is an energy policy. <laughs> <laughs> it's something we've been saying for a very long time. <laughs> great, great question. There was, there was two in one. You snuck two in there. Okay, we're going to go over here. Okay, um, my name is Pete Romer. I'm in the uh, bioengineering section. GE Healthcare retired. Spent my entire career in magnetic resonance imaging. My question relates to some of our uh, fusion energy um, research and, and, and development pathway. As a graduate student at MIT in 1982, <coughs> my professor Larry Litsky who was the associate director at the Plasma Fusion Center, at the time made some very public statements about the deuterium tritium fuel cycle. And he basically said that we're spending too much effort on the deuterium tritium fuel cycle because it's never going to lead to a reactor that we would ever want to make commercially. And his argument was, let's assume we make the perfectly uh, formulated plasma. You're almost there. Had all the material science working. We then would produce a reactor that's 10 times less dense, in other words, the physical infrastructure of a comparable fission reactor, but we'd still need a one meter thick of, of liquid lithium to capture the neutron and reproduce the tritium, and that was this radioactive cesspool. There was never gonna get commercial, you know, of, of a potential, I perhaps use the wrong word, cesspool, but, but it was radioactive and, and serious safety concerns. <clears throat> So here we are 40 years later, we're about to spend money trying to create a demonstration reactor. For his argument, the fuel cycle would never lead to commercial use. Is that where we should be spending the money? Did he get it right? Did he get it wrong? And if he got it wrong, or if he got it right, why wouldn't he be spending that money to try to get a breakthrough in an advanced fuel cycle with much less energy in the neutron, which is the primary driver of the density and the concern about the, the safety? All right, so I'm going to summarize that as, uh, clearly, Kathy, this is for you. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm going to summarize that with, um, uh, I guess, discuss with us the viability of, of fusion and um, I think what it's like to be working on a program that has such a long R&D runway and um, you know, the, the worthiness of that investment. Okay, so let me start out by saying I started in fusion back when I was a graduate student. So you can assume, rightly, that's been a while. 
I would argue that we've learned quite a bit. So first of all, there are a lot of opi opinions out there and some very, very passionate opinions. There are opinions about the deuterium-tritium fuel cycle. Some would argue we should go to deuterium-deuterium. Now the challenge there is you have to go 10 times hotter, but it's certainly a possibility. You get fewer neutrons. There's work looking at that. Um, D-helium-3 <coughs> is another one. So there are a lot of different fuel cycles out there. Why are we focused? at least if you look at ITER, on deuterium-tritium, because it's the easiest. And the information that you get from it will inform many other options. The other thing, the other question, and you didn't ask this, is why are we focused on tokamaks, right, the donut-shaped machine? Because the largest database exists for it, and again, data we can get from Tokamax is applicable to many of the other configurations. Now, my role in my early career was actually working on the fusion safety program, so I would be happy to have a, a discussion with Professor Lidsky about the safety of fusion energy. We looked quite a bit at that. Are there challenges? Absolutely. Tritium. Tritium kind of gets everywhere, and you don't want to get it into the water systems. You don't want to breathe it. It's an alpha emitter. No problem. Your skin stops alphas, but your lungs don't. Your, the inside of your body doesn't. So that all has to be mitigated. At uh, the tritium fusion test reactor at Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory back in the <clears throat> 90s or early 2000s, it's all sort of fuzzy to me now, they did uh, deuterium-tritium shots in their reactor. They were able to manage tritium there at PPPL. So you can absolutely do it. Now, ultimately, will the commercial plant end up being a tokamak? I don't know. There are as many people that says it should as there are people that says it shouldn't. And that's why the companies that, uh, ex that are making an investment in some cases in tokamak designs, in some cases in what are called field reverse configurations, inertial fusion, magnetized target fusion, that's all really good because the jury's still out on what's gonna end up being better. Now the other thing I will say, one of the ways that we make fusion um, more economical, because it's got low power density, right? Low power density typically isn't economical. High, uh, high temperature superconducting magnets. Can we raise the temperature of the superconducting magnets? We can, magnets, magnets, magnets. We can make a smaller device. That's really good from a cost perspective. But as an in engineer, because now I'm going to play devil's advocate, I'm going to say, well, that's really energetic neutrons on a small, smaller um, surface. That's going to be super hard on materials. So I go back to the materials challenges. So. Is it worthwhile investing in fusion? Absolutely. There are multiple pathways being investigated. U.S. is not the only one. And, and as a matter of fact, we're in danger of losing our leadership position. Maybe we've already kind of lost it to, for example, the U.K. or China. So I know I've said quite a bit, but I would, I would not agree with everything that you've said. Yeah, and, and maybe you didn't quite answer the question, because I don't disagree with the need for the fusion research. What I'm questioning is whether you should be putting together a demonstration power plant based on a DT fuel cycle yeah. that, mm -hmm. that um, could take a lot of investment away from perhaps an advanced fuel cycle and a need for a breakthrough yes. vers versus something that I think is, in whatever form you're talking about, it doesn't have to be a tokamak. It's fundamentally a low power density uh, device. Okay, and, and we'll, we'll do this so, add-on. Uh, okay. um, I'll, I'll, we'll I'll, I'll leave it there. Have you Thank you. Consider the option of a demonstration versus um, <clears throat> th that's what you're getting at, right? You're asking why why are we doing a demonstration with the deuterium tritium fuel cycle? With with right, and then you're talking about showing it to 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 um, you know people that might buy it, but that's not I again mean, again. What I will say is what we learned from, from the deuterium tritium fuel cycle is applicable broadly. I'll point to Commonwealth Fusion Systems, which actually came out of MIT. Theirs is deuterium tritium with high temperature superconductors, so they can make it smaller. So there's a lot that's been learned since back then. And again, international agreement that if what you want to understand is a self-heating plasma doing with deuterium and tritium will get us there yeah, no. more quickly and reduce that risk. No argument with Great. that. So Thank good you. question, Thank good you. answer, and I also welcome you guys to continue the conversation afterwards at the, at the front of the stage. Okay, next question. Yeah. Uh, Madame Basin, uh, uh, Section 3, and uh, hello, Gavin. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> anyway, uh, many thanks, first of all, for your uh, 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 presentation, the energy, and everything you showed into going uh, toward this important goal for all of us. Uh, my question and comment and a challenge for all of us is that as an individual as well as as an academy and a society, we have a very important role to play, but we must start with facts as engineers, right? So we got to give factual data about EVs, about this and that. What is the true net uh, carbon contribution, okay? Without that, we are just fooling ourselves, and then we lose trust. So it's a communication message, and uh, it, 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 we just have to, must do that. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on that aspect of our individual responsibility and a, as a society responsibility to communicate clearly and have that data of what is the true carbon contribution for all of these approaches. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, in terms of facts, obviously there's been a lot of research that you've been relying on to this point. Um, how much is that is what we need to move forward? How much more fact finding are we doing? So, so the, num the numbers I put up, Madame, were all guesswork. They were all projections, right? Because any anyone can take data from the BP Statistical Review of Energy and, pro and project things forward, right? You can you can make whatever forecast you like, and um, <coughs> the IPCC and others make forecasts. So those are all made up numbers, um, ma made up on the basis of fairly good models with a lot of thought behind them, but nonetheless they're projections. I think. Um, when we start talking about the carbon intensity of anything, it is very important for us to um, speak from facts. And it's very important, particularly for those in the audience who are educators, that, that everyone who's coming through any kind of science or technology degree program needs to be able to understand life cycle implications of technology. They need to be able to look at things on a system-wide basis and understand what, what are the, what are the um, inputs and outputs, what is the carbon footprint. I'm not saying that everyone necessarily has to take a formal class in life cycle analysis, but at least everyone's got to be able to understand things well enough to, to make educated um, statements around carbon footprints. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. Okay, question over here. Hi. Hi, I'm Julie Cornfield from Chemical Engineering at Caltech, and I have a question for you, Jose. Um, I was talking to the administration of Caltech saying, we should you know, line ourselves up for one of these new scale reactors. It would help Caltech get off the grid or get to net zero, right? It's almost exactly the shortfall compared to our solar and fuel cell generating capacity. Um, and they said, no way. <laughs> you can install it when it's not radioactive, but as soon as you turn it on, you own tonnage of radioactive material. Help me go back to them and rebut that argument. Sure, that's great. I, I got my order book here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Made a sale here. That's no, that's that's great, and that's that's not an, uh, an unusual thing. We we get asked that uh, we get asked that quite a bit in terms of well, what happens you know once your fuel is used and uh, and uh, and how is that handled? Uh, so really, that fuel once once it's removed from the reactor uh, and it's stored, uh, and uh, the, the best practice in the U.S. is currently. Uh, you, you, you have it in a pool for about five years, then you can take it out, then it goes into a, a dry cash storage. But that fuel really belongs to the Department of Energy. But let me clarify, their objection was that all the metal of the entire system is now radioactive. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, so in terms of uh, radiation of materials, that's a, it's, it's a little bit different. Uh, so these are, these are low level wastes. So they, they can be readily disposed of. Uh, the fuel, I thought you were talking specifically about the fuel. I uh, know the, the, the reactor vessel, the containment, uh, those things are, are uh, especially for our design, uh, because of the, uh, the, the types of materials we're using, are, are relatively uh, what we call low, low level radioactive waste, which can be disposed of and, and has been disposed of in the past. Uh, so that's, that's a bit different than the, than the long term uh, fuel. Yeah, but we'd be, I'd be glad to work with you on, on additional uh, points if you like. Excellent. Quick yeah, and thank you. And I'll just point out that the University of Illinois is currently working to put in a microreactor um, at their facility, and it's been completely embraced by the community. Um, they're replacing a coal-fired power plant, and according to um, the university, they got hundreds of letters every year, why are we still burning coal, why are we con um, contributing to global warming? And so this can be accepted. 
um, and a university is a, is a good test place for this, so. Great, those are good points. I know even in my local community, when there's upgrades, there, there needs to be advocates for, for some of these new technologies, so really, really great points. Okay, over here. Hi, my name is Shmuel Oren. I'm professor of the graduate school at UC Berkeley. And uh, everybody on this panel seems to represent some aspect of the supply side. But as we increasing the percentage of renewables in the supply mix, the supply becomes more uncertain and more variable. So perhaps nobody mentioned we need a paradigm shift that from supply following the demand to demand following the supply, like in many other industry. Um, you know, we have today many edge technologies that can be deployed behind the meter that will facilitate such a vision. And we need some incentives, of course, to mobilize that kind of flexibility on the demand side. That um, we're talking about storage. The low-hanging fruit in storage is thermal storage in buildings, in the refrigeration system, in the HVAC systems. And uh, we have the technology to mobilize such storage uh, <coughs> so that the demand can actually follow the supply in a, and, and that will tremendously uh, make a big move toward uh, mitigating some of this uncertainty and volatility created by the sun doesn't shine or the wind doesn't blow. So uh, this, this is kind of the direction that we should pursue perhaps more aggressively, both on, in ter terms of the policy that will incentivize uh, the f and mobilize load flexibility and uh, change that thing that when, uh, you know, not when you turn the switch, we always expect the lights to be on. Well, in, an, in other industry, people adjust their, um, uh, when they book a flight, depending on what's available and uh, when the price is right. So we can do that. In, we have the technology to do that in the electric power industry. So some of when people talk about deploying infrastructure, a, a lot of the infrastructure has to be deployed on the demand side to enable that. Great. So I think, I think the, the topic here is about supply and demand. And Sarah, I'd love for you to take this. And I mean, I'd yeah. say even in California, we've had these crazy heat waves. And I know my thermostat limited me. <laughs> like, you cannot go colder. Um, and so I know there's, there's a balance here of supply and demand. So why don't, you, why don't you take that on? Yes, so that's actually a fascinating story of what happened in California. They got to the point where they said, we're, the next step is rolling blackouts. We can't meet this demand. And they put out a message on the cell phones to everybody to say, be prepared. You may get hit with a rolling blackout. And if you can help us in any way, stop using electricity. And the demand went way down. Like, it dropped like two or three gigawatts. Yes. Um, and so they found this is like a social media exercise. What can we do to influence how the demand goes? But I think the other turnaround, so there is the, the question of if we're in trouble, can we get um, people, and, and obviously there are lots of programs out there where you get paid to turn off um, whatever it is. But I was talking before about that extra electricity. When the sun comes up and we've got a lot of solar electricity, we can think of that as, well, that's going to just have to get thrown away, so that's a problem. Or we can think about it as an opportunity. As we look at decarbonizing, whether it's with nuclear or whatever, we have a major problem that our world currently runs on natural gas, that people heat their homes with natural gas, they cook their food with natural gas. Are we going to figure out how to replace all that natural gas with hydrogen or something else that will enable us to not have to electrify the the challenge of electrifying everything between now and 2050 is really big. Can you go into every house and replace every furnace with a heat pump? That's really difficult. But what we might be able to do is to get electrolyzers that are cheap. If you look at the economics of green hydrogen, and so green hydrogen is if you take, say, solar or wind electricity and make, uh, take water, split it, and now you have hydrogen that's been made without any carbon dioxide emissions. If you look at, we're going to need a lot of hydrogen to solve all that. What if we took that opportunity that now we can create a demand that's just when the sun is up, just when the electricity prices are low, and we can generate lots and lots of hydrogen, which then we can store maybe in a salt dome underground cavern or 
or maybe um, there, there are lots of strategies. I'll, I'll get started talking too much about it. <laughs> the um, UC Berkeley, or Berkeley National Lab did a study about what fraction of our loads today can easily be shifted with demand management practices, and it was something like 6%. So we want these lights to be on right now. We're not going to be able to shift those. If you get more than, you can maybe have your dishwasher run at a different hour of the day than now. If you look at the number of loads that you can shift, currently it's something like 6% before you get to the point where it's better just to put in a battery. But if we now look at changing the other sectors, so now we're meeting our transportation needs with electricity and we can charge the car at different times depending upon the availability of the electricity. If we look at that we're going to need to generate a lot of hydrogen, that becomes a huge flexible load. If we decide we're gonna pull carbon dioxide out of the air to sequester it, that's also a huge flexible load. And so we don't necessarily have to use batteries to do all of the demand and supply. So I like your suggestion. We need to be thinking about the demand and all these flexible loads that we can create then the demand can um, match the supply much easier. But we can go beyond the 6%. If, for example, every high-rise building, we put ice tanks to create ice and then not use electricity for air conditioning during daytime by just running the air over the ice, or that those kind of technologies, they are very simple, low-tech, and they can go a long way toward mobilizing heat storage and, um, and storing power. I mean, battery lithium is expensive compared to building an ice tank. So whether it's storing heat or storing fertilizer or exactly. storing hydrogen or whatever it is, there are lots and lots of things we can store that will be useful. I agree. Great, thanks for that question. Okay, over here. Great, uh, uh, Ron Lantanison, uh, Section 9, Materials Engineering. Um, I'm also the Editor-in-Chief of The Bridge, and I just wanna say that uh, from wearing my bridge hat, that this has been a wonderful morning of conversation <laughs> on two of the planet's most pressing issues, climate change and the need to adjust to the energy demands of a growing population. So I, I think it's been really a wonderful morning. But I do have a question, maybe two questions. Okay. Uh, we'll Dr. Give you one. Reyes, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> Dr. Reyes, you mentioned in one of your slides, you had two words that really caught my attention. One was hydrogen production, which has been mentioned a number of times, but also desalination. So my questions are number one. On the subject of desalination, we, we live on a planet that is covered with nearly 70% water, salt water. In the Middle East, most of the potable water is produced by desalination. Can you envision scaling up desalination to solve some of the planet's pressing problems with droughts in California and in Africa and other parts of the world? And then, and then secondly, and we take these in turn, but secondly, one of the other products of the Obama White House and OSTP during John Holdren's uh, term was a program called the Materials Genome Initiative. Th this initiative uh, has as its goal developing new materials to meet pressing national needs. And so, for example, there is a program within the Department of Energy called Hydrogen, Hydrogen, and it is a hydrogen generation, hydrogen production uh, effort aimed at using semiconductor photoelectrodes to split water to produce hydrogen and oxygen. And the hydrogen obviously can become a fuel source. Now, sunlight and water are both free. There are no geopolitical boundaries. Uh, you, you know, uh, if we're clever about it and we find a good semiconductor photoelectric, we really can make a difference in how the world responds to its climate and its energy needs. All right. So I'm just curious, do you have a... We're going to start with desalination, all right? Yeah, the first one is desalination. First so desalination, go for it. Well, desalin that's, a, that's a great question because we, we look at the, the global needs for water. We did a market study looking at water and, 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 and we started to realize that potentially in some parts of the world, the, the, the economics of water production outweighs the electricity production. So it's kind of interesting. One module uh, coupled to uh, reverse uh, osmosis uh, a desalination system will produce about 77 million gallons of clean water per day. Uh, so four modules would be enough for a city the size of Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, so when you start thinking at, at commercial scales, you realize that the potential is enormous. Uh, we can solve the, the water issue, uh, but it, it requires will and the ability to deploy these plants relatively quickly. Uh, so, so that's first on desalination. 
On, on hydrogen, I think you're right. Uh, you know, we've, uh, the other thing we've been studying is the, the whole energy imbalance market. The idea that, well, in California during the day, a lot of solar, uh, what do you do at night? Uh, so you know, having, having uh, small modular reactors produce hydrogen during the day mm -hmm. and store it, just like you're, you're discussing, yeah. uh, Sarah, uh, producing that hydrogen during the day, then at night uh, when, when actually the price of electricity goes up uh, because you're looking for clean energy at night when it's maybe not available, uh, making it economic that way by putting your plants at full power, your small modular reactors full power, and also uh, putting that, the uh, hydrogen back to fuel cells to produce electricity. Right. So there's, uh, there's, I, I'm, I'm really excited about the, the potential for uh, other approaches to, to, uh, to hydrogen production, which I'd like to learn a lot more about. So okay. thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Okay, we're going to go over here. Yeah, uh, Mark Lavoy, Stanford University. Uh, I'm in computing, uh, but what's most relevant here is that I am a recent uh, buyer of a Tesla Model 3. <laughs> so um, Elon Musk, who is also an inductee, like myself in 2022, uh, is not here. But uh, in an in interview recently, um, he was asked what happens with uh, everyone buying EVs, maybe Teslas, to the uh, electric grid, and that it would, uh, uh, I think he had a statistic like it would raise demand in the United States if all transportation were electric by a factor of something like two. I'm not sure if that, that, that number is correct. But when asked that question, he said, I think the solution is going to have to be local meaning presumably local uh, solar panels and local storage. Of course, he makes products in that area. What does the panel think <laughs> about local versus national scale um, solar and storage? I is he right that actually local solutions, everyone putting solar on their roofs and having batteries attached to their garage could really be a substantial uh, part of the answer? Okay, I'm gonna rephrase this so no one feels like they're, they're <laughs> Like rebuffing Elon Musk's comments, <laughs> but but I'm gonna um, but I'm gonna phrase it just in terms of what are your thoughts on local? Uh, you know, do we are we all gonna have solar cells in the future? Um, local versus kind of micro versus macro. What are we thinking here, Gavin? We'll start with you. So so, so all solutions to some extent need to be local, but high density housing, high density living, is much more sustainable than low density. Right, so if you're going to have people, if you're going to have nine and a half billion people, you really need them to live in cities. You need, you need the synergies you get from living in cities. And with that sort of population density, you can't provide enough energy from everybody having a, their own solar panel on the roof. There's just not enough space for it. So you can't completely solve the problem locally. Um, but I want to go in a different direction with the question, if I may, because it does raise another interesting, an, another interesting problem. Um, electrification is the answer on decarbonizing most of the, of the energy applications, right? Um, we, we, we do need to electrify light duty vehicles and um, home heating can probably be electrified. But I think as, as Sarah pointed out, we have to be careful because if you electrify while you're making your electricity from um, natural gas and coal, mm -hmm. you're actually just prolonging the use of natural gas and coal. This is why it really is critical that we, that we develop small modular nuclear reactors, that we put way more solar power in. And it actually gets to the point that was made earlier about the cost of the energy transition. The, the numbers that I put out, the 30 to 60 trillion dollars, are at today's prices. If we can commercialize lower cost nuclear power, if we can continue driving down the, the price of uh, solar power with, with advances in solar power, the price ticket actually comes down. That's the real trick. And how about the That doesn't, how that about doesn't the matter grid? whether you're solving it locally or whether you're solving it with a solar, with a solar farm somewhere out in the desert and you're, and you're, you're investing in the grid. Right. All of the above will work. I, I think Elon Musk's concern was that the EV cars would overwhelm the grid. So can that grid problem be solved by a more local solution than a national level solution? Why don't we, why don't we go to Sarah, because I know you've... Well, I might things. say that the, the debate between um, whether you're using more of a regional grid or microgrids, both are like a fad right now. The, if you t it, like um, Governor Brown in California was really pushing the regional grid, but then there was also a lot of funding for microgrids, and it's kind of like, well, which is the better way? And I think it comes down to a question of what is the relative cost and ability to put in transmission versus the relative cost and ability to put in storage. And if you can put in low cost storage, then eventually you could get, and actually you can get there pretty close in places like San Diego today where the summer and winter loads are very similar, 
But if you can put in enough storage that you can cut the, the wire that comes into your house and have your own local system, think of how much we would save to not need to maintain that distribution grid. But if you look at the challenge of actually being able to meet your energy needs on a week when there's little sun and little wind, and where I live, that does happen, um, the cost of putting in enough storage to get me through that week is really prohibitive. And so the question is, it really comes down to how far can we advance the storage technology, how far can we advance the, the transmission, and then there's the question with the distrib distribution. If we can get the small modular reactors and plop them strategically in various locations, we might be able to do microgrids using that all, all year round. I don't know. It all becomes a question of which technology comes down and costs the most. Can, can I just add one more point, thinking a little bit less parochially, right? We, we, have, we have lived with energy transportation over massive distances. The energy we consume comes from the Middle East, it comes from West Africa, it comes from all around the world. And there'll be an imbalance even with renewable power. There are going to be new energy powers. Western Australia, they're already putting in solar power with the intent of electrolyzing water to make hydrogen to, turn, to, to then carry by boat by one means or another to, get, to ship it to Japan because they've got an excess of solar power. Namibia's got an excess of solar power, right? The, the Sahara has an excess of solar power. So as the price of solar comes down, more and more countries are gonna become emerging solar power exporters. And that won't necessarily have to be through the electric grid because that can be through hydrogen. Okay. Amy, do you have anything to add for this? Sure, I'll, I, I'll just add that I think it's all of the above. Um, we need to have as much rooftop solar as we can have. Um, there's new technologies in distributed wind. Um, can we have that? And then also we ha need to have the small modular reactors, the base load power that all those can tie into. So I think it's gonna be a more complex grid and we need all of the above. You know, I pay $8 a month for my electricity because I have solar panels and it's a great deal. Um, and all that I think is just the tax piece of it. So it is, there are incentives out there for people to go to this and I think as it gets more incentivized, um, we're gonna go to that, that all of the above. Great. Okay, we have time for maybe one or two more questions, and then I'm gonna tee you guys up, because at the end, I'm gonna let each of you kind of have like Twitter-length cl closing remarks. <laughs> uh, so we'll take this question here. Uh, my name is Anjan Bose, uh, a professor at Washington State University, and I work on the power grid, the operation of the power grid. The question I have is about uh, uh, the theme that's been sort of underlying all of the this morning's talk that this is a very complex uh, system. It is actually a system of systems and there's a lot of interaction between these various systems. And the question I have is how do we get it right? I mean, we heard of a lot of possibilities this morning. You know, you could do this or that or the other thing and you can do it on the edge or you can do it with lots of new transmission. Um, so who will get that system right? Because what is happening today, if you think of what is happening today, something went wrong on the Texas system, right? We didn't get it right. Something went wrong with the California system, even recently, but also over the last couple of years, and we still haven't got that right. And somebody said, uh, I think one of you said, that we're still using planning processes that are from last century, and so, so we need to change that. So all of these things should, are in the area of should, what, we, what should be done. But let me just uh, end by saying that if we don't get it right, we are getting, going to get more and more of these situations where we're turning the lights off. And, and the obvious problem is that, you know, we're getting, uh, you know, how many, I can't remember how many people died on the Texas thing, but that's not the biggest problem in my mind. The problem is more that if we don't get it right, the public mm. perception is going to be that we're changing too fast, we're getting it wrong. And, and I don't, I'm not just speculating on that. The South Australia blackout about five years ago, four years ago, actually resulted in the change of the government of the province because the opposition came in and said, these guys put in solar power too fast. 
without actually looking at why things wouldn't work right, and they lost it. So you, are, you don't want that. So I think so what you're getting right. at here is it, it's a bit of a communication. We have a lot, of, it's a huge problem, right? And there are a lot of different solutions, and everyone across industry, public sector, private sector, are working on all these different solutions. How do we get it right? How do we communicate across all of these different innovations to have that path forward that's going to get us there in 2050? What is the decision making process? All right, go ahead, Amy. I, I think a big part of the decision process is the, the regulatory agencies, right? The Public Utility Commission. It was 12 o'clock. Um, one reason mm -hmm. that the Texas grid failed is because they did not require um, the natural gas lines to be heat traced. Um, and so it was a failure of the delivery of natural gas, which caused, for the majority of it, for the ERCOT problem that we saw in 2021. And so as the population sees that um, these things are happening, they need to hold their public utility commissions, regulatory commissions accountable so that they are making decisions based on where we are headed rather than where we've been in the past. So I think a lot of it is up to us um, as was advocated in the earlier talk for us to go engage in these commissions and talk to others about it because that's really who's going, who makes the requirements. Great, and I think that's a good segue for us to wrap things up. Um, how do we all work together across the aisle uh, as engineers to, to innovate, to invest, to push things forward, to get us to uh, you know, our goal in 2050? So I'd love for each of you to give some, some closing remarks and then we're gonna button things up. Gavin, why don't we start with you? So, uh, you know, I think uh, John put it well, right? These are big existential challenges, but they're fantastic opportunities. There's, there's a lot needs to be done. There's a lot of great science needs to be discovered. There's a lot of, opportunity to invent things. There's a lot of opportunities to make money. It's a, it's a great engineering grand challenge to navigate the energy transition. Great, Sarah. That's a good statement. My favorite quote is, we need to stop being against the things we aren't 100% for. There's no perfect solution out there, but we've got a lot of really promising solutions and a lot of really brilliant people in the room who have ideas and directions to go, and if we can use each of those and then be smart about how we do them together, then we'll be able to solve the problems. Great, Jose. Yeah, I, I believe that we need to align, <laughs> align ourselves so that we're, we're all working towards the same, the same effort in an efficient manner. Uh, we need to design for impact, uh, be thinking about commercial scale, uh, either hydrogen, or power, uh, desalination, uh, we need to make an impact with our designs. And lastly, we need to fund for success. We need to have the funding available to, to really be successful in our, in our approaches. So that's what I would suggest. Okay, Kathy. And I resonate with what's been said previously. I won't repeat that. I'll, I'll just say two things. One is, again, we've got to look at these from the systems perspective, unintended consequences even outside of energy distribution. And the other thing that we haven't talked at all about today, we have underserved communities in the United States. How are we going to bring them into all of this? We always talk about developing countries. We've got some serious problems in the United States. And where I live in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, there are three counties around us that are amongst the poorest counties. So that's the other piece we have to remember. Yeah, and I'd, I'd second that, that energy justice is a big piece of this, and we have the opportunity to design a grid that can serve everyone in the United States, an energy system that can serve everybody economically, and that's what needs to be our end goal. Right, well, I want to thank all of our panelists for joining us here today. Thank you for sharing your expertise. Um, thank you for taking so many wonderful questions. Um, and yes, we all need to get aligned. And I think having conversations like this, having forums like this are, are a step in the right direction so we can all stay educated, informed, go out there and communicate with one voice as engineers. Um, so thank you again for joining this annual forum on engineering challenges and opportunities of transitioning to net zero carbon. And I'm going to turn it over to Al. Yeah, thank, thank you. So a special NEE thanks to Gavin, Sarah, Jose, Catherine, and Amy. It was really informative and forward-looking, a perfect complement to what John Holdren said earlier this morning. I think it really fit together very nicely as a package. And there's no doubt that decarbonization and our future energy supply are really critical issues. In the end, we'd like to thank you for the fourth time for your outstanding job and your expertise in moderating this discussion. And it no doubt will propel us forward with, I think, some positive, positive effects. 
I'd also like to take a moment to remind those of you who will still be here tomorrow that the Brill Lecture takes place between 2 to 5. NEE member Bobby Braun is the recipient of the 2022 Yvonne Brill Lecture in Aerospace Engineering. And his topic is, Are We Alone? And maybe that's just another episode of The X-Files. You know, we'll, we shall find out. But it'll be held here in the auditorium and live streamed at the NEE website. And we're thankful for all of you who are participating. As we close out the entire, entire weekend here, except for the dinner dance, which if you'd like to see John and me try to dance with their wives, you could be entertained. <laughs> but thank you all for participating, and we want to especially congratulate all of our new members and international members on their induction. <laughs> and we hope that we all, that you all travel safe, and we see you next year in three dimensions as well. <laughs> Off to our section meetings and lunch. Thank you.